We get excited about announcements around here and pretty much everything else. We are a life church. And another word to be excited, church. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, man, I want to give a big shout out to these teenagers. My goodness, look at this. Golly. Wow, what is God doing in our youth group? In case you didn't know, that man standing up is not one of the youth. He is the youth pastor. Let's give it up for Pastor Darnell. Pastor Alicia, our youth pastors, they do a great, great job. Uh, I was not here this past Wednesday night. Me and my family were on vacation this week, and uh, we were told that there was more teenagers upstairs than adults downstairs. My goodness, that's amazing. And so I think that's a, a challenge to the adults. You know, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, we can't let these kids outdo us. We're the leadership of the church, you know, we're the moms and dads and the, anyways, no, I'm really excited for, for, I consider that to be a win in our church this morning. And I consider last Sunday to be a win. Last Sunday, we baptized 20 people, praise God. Amen. And in that same service, five people gave their life to the Lord. And we don't always shout out how many people gave or whatever, but we do tally it up, and the Lord is, is really moving, and so we're, we're excited about every soul. Every soul, every person matters to God. You matter. You're very important to the Lord. He loves you. He paid a high price for you, so every person matters, and we believe that around here. Um, so I will just tell you, I am still on a high, though, from last Sunday. I mean, all week long on vacation and that kind of thing. I mean, just, just, just riding a high. I love to see people come to Christ. I love to see people baptized in the Holy Spirit. I love to see people baptized in water. And uh, that was so much fun. It was a moving service. And, and so today is uh, the Sunday before all the kids and teachers, we say teachers too, uh, go back to school. And we know if you're a teacher in the house, you've been back to school sort of getting ready. But, but all the uh, energetic kiddos have not got there yet. And they're coming, coming this week. So at the end of the service, we're, we're going to do our prayer time then where we pray for people. We're going to pray for every student that's going to school of any kind. Uh, we want you and your family to come forward at the end of the service. And so the kids are going to come out of the children's church. And when they do, their, their moms and dads, they're just going to come sit with you. And it'll only be a few minutes. And then we'll ask everybody to come up. And so the way we would like to do it, just give you some instruction, is we want the kids to just, you know, go all the way across here. We're talking about from the little ones all the way into college. Uh, you know, no one's too cool for prayer. Uh, we're not going to force anybody for prayer. But uh, And then if your parents are here with you today, uh, if the parents are here, come and stand behind them and stand with them. And we're just going to pray. We're all going to pray. We're going to dedicate this year to the Lord. We're going to ask God to give grace and mercy and just, just favor and just for it to be a great, great year. We want it to be. We know there's challenges. Uh, we also know that there's some that are a little anxious and a little scared right now. We know there's some parents praying and saying, I just want my kids to, to have a good year. I want them to make the right types of friends and, you know, all that kind of stuff, not be led astray, not get into something this year. Or if they're into something, to get out of it this year. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And so... We believe God is that good, and uh, so we're going to be doing that today. Uh, I want to get into part two of our series right now. It's called uh, Prayers That Break Through. Prayers That Break Through. So get out your notes right now. If you need them, raise your hand. Our ushers will bring them to you. And also, if you need a pen. So if you don't have a pen, we have these really neat pens that say a live church, and we'll get those to you. And so, uh, you know, here's a question that, that I think a lot of people would ask. What's the best way to pray? And I'm not asking you to give me an answer right now. I'm going to talk about another way to pray. Last week we talked about praying the pattern of the Lord's Prayer, how the Lord prayed. And he, when they said, teach us to pray, he said, this is the pattern. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he started with worship, right, declaring who God is. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The surrender, God, just like as easy as it is in heaven, for your will to be done, we want it to be done here. Give us this day our daily bread where we begin to ask the Lord after we've worshiped, after we've surrendered our lives to him, okay, in, in, in your time. Uh, give us this day we begin to make our request, our daily bread. Forgive us of our, our debts where we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins, our debts, as we forgive those that have, you know, our debtors or those that have sinned against us. So we forgive people. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
I think that speaks for itself. It's more requests. Lord, be with my son. Be with my daughter. Lord, be with me at work today. Lord, touch my husband, my wife. Lead them not into temptation, but deliver our family, Lord, from evil. And then with declaration at the end, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen? You see how powerful that prayer is? And when you pray like that, God listens. And he's always listening. You need to know that. But, but, but when you go through the pattern of the prayer, it builds your faith. It puts your heart in the right place. Because I'm going to tell you something. When your heart is wrong and you're starting to ask of God, you're probably going to ask wrong. You, you might demand. You might ask God for the wrong thing. But when you go through the pattern of worshiping and surrendering and receiving forgiveness, something changes in you, and then what you ask is going to be more close to the will of God. That's why, how I many know we do well with patterns? I mean, it's like, you give me a system. And if, if you give me a system and I can follow it, then I can do that. But a lot of people, they're like, I don't know what to say. You, say, you know, pray over the food. I don't know what to say. You know, we're, we, we stand here, when we do prayer on, on throughout the week and the 21 days of prayer, probably about 45 minutes or so of that is just people out there praying on their own. We've got worship music going, and you just, you're just on your And then we come together the last 15 to 30 minutes of it, and, and we kind of form a circle as big as we need to, however many people are here. And, and we just begin to pray together in agreement, the Bible talks about, and, and we agree, and different ones lead out. And there's always people that are like, well, I don't, I, I don't want to lead out in prayer. And some of it's just being shy, and that's okay. Some of it might be something like, I, I don't know what to say, and that's okay wherever you're at, and then you got the others that are like just going to command the floor, you know. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray. You know, they just go, and you just, everybody, oh, man, they know how to pray. They're loud, you know. Being loud has nothing to do with it. I, you know, I remember when I was a teenager, one time I was in my bedroom, and I was just like, yeah, in the name of Jesus, I found the devil, and I'm just, ah, and I'm just praying. My dad walks in, what are you doing, son? It's 1130, or whatever time it was. And I'm like, Dad, I'm praying. I'm embarrassed when he walked in the room, you know. Dad, I'm praying because you don't have to shout. God hears you even when you pray silent, quietly. And tonight, I need you to pray quietly. I'm like, oh, I don't have to shout. Okay. But a lot of people, I think, would say, you know, if I learned to pray a certain way, would I pray better? Would it be more effective? And the answer is yes. Yeah. Training is good. You can say, well, I'm just, God just takes me as I am. Sure, go get a job like that. <laughs> I'm just going to be as I am, and I'm not going to learn anything, and I'm not going to have any instructions, no degrees. Yeah, you, I don't know where you're going to work like that. I don't know anyone that would hire you like that. Why does the church think that way? You know, we, God does accept you as you are, but he wants us to grow and to be trained and to be discipled, amen, and to, to, know, to know how to do And so that's why we're talking about prayer. I'm going to preach a message today on the tabernacle prayer. I've never preached this message. I've known about the prayer. I've known about this style of prayer. It's just a different style. But, man, this style, you know, if, when you pray this way, it op- man, I tell you what, of the, the four that we're teaching on, uh, to me, this is one of the most fascinating. Uh, it hasn't been taught a lot in the church world. A lot of people teach on the Lord's Prayer, and that's good. And that's the main way I've prayed my whole life. But this is a different type. And so, um, you know, patterns help us in situations. Uh, 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 Patterns help us to sustain things better, okay? Uh, The tabernacle was built as a pattern from God to help us learn more about him. Uh, That's what the tabernacle was for. The tabernacle, it's um, uh, it's, it's, it's to help us break through. The tabernacle was built to help us to understand God and how he works, and how to understand how to, how to deal with our sin, how to deal, you know, and how to, how to be right with God. I will tell you something. When you're not right, listen to me, when you're not right with God and you're feeling guilty, it's hard, it's hard to pray. It's hard to live a victorious Christian life when you're feeling guilty. But if you can get out from underneath that guilt and get right with God, who knows what can happen when you pray? Right. I mean, Goliath's fall. You know, mountains, it says, bow down when we pray, if you believe that. And so this is, this is a pattern here. Going to the gym is kind of like a pattern. I'm going to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever, and you get into this routine. But if you can have some type of routine, you can succeed. Without any kind of routine or pattern, then you're just, you just don't know what to do, and you're probably going to fail. And so this is one of the patterns. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 through 9, it says, And let them, this is the Lord talking, and let them make me 
a sanctuary that I may dwell, where? Among them. It was always God's will to dwell among them. Dwell according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. In other words, the, when, when the tabernacle was not created or designed just randomly by a group of guys that formed a democratic committee that, just, that voted on it. Everybody say, aye, all in favor, those opposed. It was nothing like that. It was God saying, I want you to do it this way. And it was not up for negotiation. You know, in life, there are many things, folks, you need to hear me, that are not up for negotiation. In this world that we live in, everyone has an opinion. But I'm going to tell you the truth of God's words and his thoughts are not up for your opinion. They're not up for negotiation. It really does not matter what anyone thinks. It only matters what he thinks. That's why we need to find out what he thinks. And that become our truth, what he thinks. His word become our truth. Amen. So this was the, mo- the, pa- the, uh, the, the pattern that Moses created in the wilderness um, uh, when, after they came out of Egypt, after he received the Ten Commandments, and, and they made this, um, the priests took care of it with care. The men that created the furnishings, the furniture, if you will, in, I mean, everything was down to the material, the color, the amount of gold, silver, whatever it was, it was articulated by God, and God created men that would have skill to do this exactly as he wanted uh, it was so precise. And so that tells me that God has protocol. Everybody know what protocol is? It's a system in which in this situation you act and behave this way. It's a protocol. And so God has, everyone needs to hear me, God has protocol. In other words, you can't just do it your way and expect the same results as someone that understands the protocol. Even in, under grace that, that we live under, We live under grace since Jesus died on the cross. There is still protocol. There's still uh, uh, things that you should do as you enter into God's presence. It's not just that Jesus is my best friend. It's a little deeper than that. He is God, and he wants to be your best friend. But there's there's protocol. There's statutes. And so I want to talk about the six pieces of furniture in the tabernacle and how they teach us to pray. How they teach us to pray. Number one, so uh, there was the brazen altar. The brazen altar. And can we put, do we have the picture back there up of of the tabernacle itself? That's not it. But, okay, but that is the brazen altar. All right, so we'll, um, I don't know if it got loaded or not. Okay, well, let me just, let me just create a picture. Okay, so there was this thing called the outer court. And the outer court was outside, and then when you came in through the tent or, or the outer it, there was no ceiling in this in this part of the part of the uh, the tabernacle. When you came in, the first thing that you saw was the brazen altar, and then next to that was the lavier, and it kind of looked like a bird pond or something, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was huge. And then after that, you would go into the main tent, and you would come, and there would be uh, the candlestick or the menorah. That, can turn, that burn continuously, and there was furniture, and, uh, you know, you'd go over to uh, the, the, the showbread uh, altar, and, and there was bread there, and then past that, the altar of incense, and then past that, you would go into the next level, which would be called the holies of holies, and the only one that went into the holies of holies, it was another separate room. The only one that went into the holies of holies was the high priest, and inside the holies of holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And so and inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments and the staff that, that Aaron held that budded. Uh, it was a stick that budded. It was a miracle. And so, uh, and the Ark of the Covenant was the symbol of God's presence. And so, as you can see, maybe you can see it now. Um, and so the first thing you come to is the brazen altar. And so the brazen altar, we can show that, this represents the cross. Because it was on the brazen altar that they would sacrifice animals. This is where the blood would run. And so this represents the first thing that we do when we come to the Lord is we come to the cross. This is where the sacrifice was offered. And this is how we start our prayer time. We come to the Lord in repentance at the brazen altar, back to the cross. Listen to me. At the cross is where the curses of sin and sickness, where these curses were broken over our lives. 
And so when Jesus went to the cross, all curses that we would have to face were broken here. So it's good to come in to the brazen altar where Jesus, you know, representing the cross where Jesus was sacrificed. And start there. Always start there. Amen. And, um, you know, when Jesus was beaten, um, he took the curse. By his stripes, the Bible says, we are healed. The curse of sickness and, and death. And then, you know, he, they put the crown of thorns on his head. And it has to do with the mind. And let me tell you something. If, if you are battling anxiety, if you're battling fear, worry, stress, emotions like this, depression, Jesus died to break the curse off your mind. And it's supernatural. It, this is, look, it is miraculous. That, so when we come to the cross, understand the curse of the mind, which is the battlefield. The battlefield takes place in the, the spiritual warfare and these kinds of things. They all take place in the mind. Jesus died to break that off of you. Once we understand, the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. And it says, if you're fearful, you've not been made perfect in his love. Once we understand the unconditional, perfect love of God and that Jesus broke the call, curse of those things, then you can relax and just be with God and follow God and know that tomorrow, no matter what faces you, he's going to be there. And if tomorrow you wake up and you get a fight of Goliath, he's going to be there with you to take it down. And if tomorrow you wake up and it's just the peace of God, he's there giving you his peace. One of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. Amen. And so, you know, forgiveness and those kinds of things. The curse of poverty. Y'all hear me? It's a curse. Jesus died to, 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 uh, to break those curses and many, many others. And then after you go to the cross in the, in the morning and you make sure you're right with God and these things, then we go to the, la the labor. Uh, some people call it the bird bath, but it's not a bird bath, y'all. <laughs> it's much more than that. So this this big round uh, it had water in it. And, and underneath it, if we have that picture of the labor, can y'all put that up? Uh, underneath it, we had, it, it, it was a mirror. So here's the thing. It looked like a mirror. When the priest or, or the people would go up into the labor and they would look, the water would be still and they could see themselves. And so this is the time. This, repre this represents, in your notes, Sanctification. Sanctification, and what is sanctification? It's a process of becoming like Jesus. And how many know, it, it, becoming like Jesus is a process. You don't just wake up one day and you're like perfect. It's a process, isn't it? And so when you look into the water and you see yourself, then you ask yourself, is there anything in my life that is eclipsing God? Is there anything that's in front of me? Is there anything that is not right? That's, that is, here's, a, here's a way of saying it. Is there anything I am putting before God? Is there anything that is coming first when God should be coming first? And if there is, you see it. Why? Because you are self-examining. You see it. And then if you're aware of it, you can ask God to remove it. You can repent of it. You need to take time in your prayer time to let God just wash over you and show you things that shouldn't be there. And a lot of times, a lot of times those things that shouldn't be there, we didn't say, God, I ain't putting you first. I'm going to put my job first. God, I ain't putting you first. I'm going to put, you know, this first. I'm going to put that new car I bought out there first. I'm going to put whatever. I'm just making stuff up. But whatever it would be, God will tell you what it is. I can't tell you, right? But when you see that there's something coming before God, then you can remove it. But if you don't take time to look and see, then you don't know. And a lot of Christians live this way. They can point out your faults. Oh, that brother, right there, man, I tell you what, man, that guy's got a problem. She's a gossiper. He's, he's this, man. That, 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 he's not even nice, you know, and that kind of stuff. And we can point out everybody's stuff, but we don't look at ourselves. And you can't get better without looking at yourself. That's why the, the Levere's there. Amen. And so number three, this is the next one. And this one is the one I'm going to talk about the most today. And this is the candlestick or the menorah. This is when you actually go into the tent now. And you see this huge candlestick. It had seven candles on it. All right. 
and it burned continuously, representing, you ready for this? The seven spirits of God. You say, wait a minute, God's one spirit. He is. He is one spirit. But how many know I can have a spirit of anger and a spirit of celebration, and that's just me? Does everybody understand? And it's just me. It's just part of who I am. And so let's talk about this right quick because, um, you know, this represents the Holy Spirit. Believe that or not. It represents the Holy Spirit. It was always burning continuously with fire. And the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a baptism of fire. And we think of the fire of God. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. And so Isaiah eleven two 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And so these things right here represent the seven candles. And the first one would be the one in the middle. This is The, the one in the middle is, is, is going to be the anchor that holds the whole thing together. It's, it's, it's the strongest support. And so... Um, And so the one in the middle, um, trying to get back to it, uh, represents, number one, intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. God wants you to have a relationship with him, but not to know about him. God would like you to know him. And when the scripture talks about knowing him, that same word know is the, is the same word used to describe when a man gets married and knows his wife. It means intimacy. It means intimacy. When a man in the Bible, say King David, married one of his wives, because he had multiple, not that we should, but it said he would go and lie with her and he knew her. Does that make sense to everybody without getting any deeper than that? That knowing God is the same thing. And it doesn't necessarily suggest sex, but it suggests intimacy intimacy. And so intimacy with God, meaning you know God and God knows you and you have a relationship and you talk about it and you know, you can say today God was saying to me and God revealed to me and I obeyed him and this happened. That's the way God wants. And without this, the other six fall apart. Okay. Without the intimacy, you really can't have the other six. And so number two would be the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of wisdom or order, the spirit of wisdom and order. And so wisdom is the ability to make complex things simple. Man, I can't figure this out. This is too big for me. And someone comes with wisdom and says, this is easy. You just do this, this, and this. Oh, that's not so hard, right? But the man or the woman with wisdom can come and say, this is how you do it. And so there's a spirit from God that comes and says, this is how you do it, where God will impart his wisdom to you. And I will tell you, if you live under the spirit of wisdom, your house is going to flourish. There's going to be peace in your home. Why? Because you're wise and you set things in order. There's going to be joy in your home. Amen. What you do for a living is going to flourish and be blessed because it's done with excellence. It's done with wisdom. It's done in order, and people respect that. There's even comfort to that. People will want to be around you because you're comforting to them, and they may not even know why. It's because there's a spirit of wisdom about you, and God would say, I would give this to you. All you have to do is ask. So in this prayer of breakthrough, you go and you come to the cross and and you, you get right, and then you examine yourself, and then you begin to pray, you know, Lord, I want more. I want more. Lord, would you pour out your spirit? I want to sit at your feet. And you begin to develop, you develop is intimacy, and then you ask the Lord, God, I pray there would be a spirit of wisdom about me, that your spirit of wisdom and order would be upon me. Amen. I, I, look, I encourage you to take this, not just write it down, but practice it this whole week and see what happens. Practice it. Amen. Here's the next one. And i got to go through these quickly. The spirit of understanding. Understanding. It's another one of the, the candlesticks, if you will, or part of the candlestick. Understanding or vision. The Bible says that the men of Issachar understood the times that they lived in. They had vision. Amen. And uh, how powerful would it be if you understood where you're at right now, what time you're living, if you could discern that. You would know when to save because you understand the time that you live in, you would know when to spend. You would know 
by the Spirit of God if it's time to buy that vehicle or not. You would know things if this is the time to launch out into something new or to hold back. If this is the time to ask for that promotion or to back away. You would know things by the spirit of understanding, by vision that God gives you. Amen? And the men of Issachar were greatly respected because they had the spirit about them. And this spirit is the spirit of God. Here's the next one. The spirit of counsel. The spirit of counsel or the ability to make decisions. Where God counsels you. Counsel is the ability to know what's real instead of a false appearance. Well, I thought, man, I really thought that, I mean, that person to me looked like they were going to be able to do it. And I hired them. And, I mean, they had all the qualifications. And I just, I, you know, I thought that, that was the right decision. And now they've, they've caused me a lot of trouble in my company. And if I had went to the Lord and said, God, give me counsel. Help me to make this decision. Maybe the Lord would have showed me the truth. How many know that's real? How many know that's every day? Amen. The spirit of counsel. Should I buy that home? Should we, should we go bigger? Should we go smaller? Counsel from the Lord. Lord, should I talk to that person right now? Should I wait? You know, those kinds of things. The ability to make decisions. I'm going to tell you something. I depend on the counsel of the Lord. And some people, you know, not too long ago, my mom said, every time you make a decision, it's right. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but I would tell you, since I have learned this and practiced this in my life, I make a whole lot better decisions than I used to. Decision-making is not just about your intelligence. If you can follow the Lord, he knows what you don't. How many would like that? Amen. That's, that's part of the spirit. Here's the next one, the spirit of might or strength. The spirit. How many know the Lord is a, is, is a warrior? Warrior is his name. I mean, he's a great... He, he is mighty in battle. It's part of his spirit. He wants the children of God to have a spirit of might on them. He don't want us to be coward, cowardly and, and faint of heart and scared. And He wants us to be courageous. And there's a spirit of might on him. When David stood in front of, as a teenager, stood in front of the Goliath, there was a spirit of might on him. And the spirit of might is a supernatural spirit of strength that will cause you to excel when others can't. He didn't learn to use the sword at this point. He took a rock, and because there was a spirit of might on him, he threw that little stone, and it hit Goliath in the forehead and sank into his head. And Goliath fell down, and David went over there and took his, took his sword from him, took his weapon, and chopped his head off, and that's how he died. Spirit of might that the Lord... Look, you can believe this or not, but I'm going to tell you, this is the way I live. And I'm not perfect at it. I'm learning and I'm growing. But I'm also at the same time trying to open the door to you, to, to understanding. It's what we're trying to do. And so one of the keys to the spirit of might is joy. The Bible says in Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. The spirit of might does not operate in fear. It's not operating anxiety or stress. The spirit of might operates in joy. The Lord wants you to be joyful. It, that's, how, that's how it works, guys. Amen. Know it. That's why we want there to be the joy of the Lord in our services, why we want it to be a celebration. Number six, the spirit of knowledge. And the spirit of knowledge is a spirit of know-how. You don't know how you know, you just know. I don't even know where I got that, but I know it's right. Yeah? That, that's the spirit of know-how that the Lord wants us to have. Amen. We can be filled with the spirit of the Lord and knowledge to do whatever he calls us to do. We, we can just know. But that's supernatural. So many people are like, I would do this for the Lord. I just don't know how. You know, I, I would try, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to fail. There's a spirit of know-how that will come upon you that you'll just know. Now, the Lord wants you to be submitted to leaders, and he wants you to go through discipleship and get your training and get your understanding Young people, he wants you to go to get those degrees and those certifications and those kinds of things. That's all real and important. But at the same time, there is a spirit of know-how, knowledge that will come upon you by the Spirit of God if you ask for it. Praise the Lord. So Exodus 31, 1 through 6, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is an example where God put the spirit of know-how in men, and they knew how to design the tabernacle according to what God said. Because if you read his specific instructions, they're a little bit vague. Like, I, if I was reading these instructions, I would have not have built what they built because I wouldn't have been able to understand it. But God said he put a spirit, you read it, of knowledge and excellence in these men, and it says they know how to do it. 
These men knew how to do it because God, the Bible says he put it in them, all right? And going on number seven, this is the last one, the fear of the Lord. And this has to do with integrity. You cannot do ministry without integrity. You can't do business without integrity. Right? It's, it's it, it, right. And so uh, the integrity, the spirit of the Lord operates through integrity, through honesty, through truthfulness. You got a problem? You just be truthful about it. You know, this guy asked me to come to, I have a little business doing lights. I, was, I, I planned to go see him the other day. Something came up where I couldn't here at the church. I just called the guy. And all these thoughts went through my head. What am I going to tell him? Because I know he, some of the people that I, I do business with, uh, they're demanding. And I know he's going to be demanding. And I just said, and, and again, the Lord said, just tell him the truth. <laughs> and I always do. But how many know what I'm talking Can I get real with you for a minute? I wanted to say something else that would make him understand better. You know, I wanted to cover it up somehow. And the Lord just said, tell him the truth. And I did. And he says, Jimmy, no problem, man. I got it. I, you know, he was so, you know, gracious about it. And even if he wasn't, so what? Better to, better to have integrity than to lose integrity over trying to please somebody. Amen. Because the next time I tell him something, because he's a client of mine, he'll believe me. Absolutely. So, all right, so those are the seven things of the candlestick, the menorah. That's a sermon in itself. I usually preach that by itself when I do preach it. All right, but let's go on. This is a system of praying. So you've gone to, through that. Number four, the showbread. The table is showbread. And this represents, anytime you see bread in the Scripture, it represents the Scripture or the Word of God. The bread represents the Word of God. So get the bread in you. The bread of life, Jesus said. He is. Get that in you. Take time in your time with God, to read the word. Let it fill you. Don't just read it quickly. Some people, you know, I know of, there are a few, these guys are kind of crazy if you ask me, but there's preachers out there that I know of that they try to read the whole Bible every month. And that's fine, but I'm going to just tell you something. If you really want to understand, you know, it's better to take a walk than it is to get on a jet. I'm just saying, if I'm going to, you know, fly to California or someplace like that, which I'm going to be doing here soon, you know, I, I, I'm not going to see anything but clouds and stuff that looks like ants when I'm, when I'm low enough. But if I was to just travel at a slower rate, I could see the beautiful creation. I could see things. I could know people. I could get the sights and the sounds. And I'm going to tell you something. When it comes to the Word of God, you don't want to get on a jet. You want to walk with God. You want the sights and the sounds and the revelations and the understandings. You want those things. And I'm going to tell you something amazing about God that I've really noticed. And let me point this out to you so maybe it will give you a deeper hunger to read the word. When you set a time aside with God and say, this is the time I am going to pray and read. When it gets to the word, and you might start with the word first. It doesn't matter. When you get there, just be led by the spirit, though, the Holy Spirit has pre-selected scriptures in advance that are going to minister to you that day. He pre-selects them. I got them here. Already decided. And when you get there, he gives them to you. And, you get, oh. and that's why I like reading the daily Bible. I read it. I love reading the daily Bible. There are passages of scriptures every day. And, and I'll read the word in one year that way. And so... But just know that even today, God has pre-selected things to give you. Why? Because he knows what you need. And he loves you enough to give you what you need today. Amen. And every day. The next one, the altar of in incense. And the altar of incense, this is what the priest would do. Can we put up a picture of that, the incense? This is what the priest would do. They would take some, some fragrance, some, uh, some incense, and they would come to the altar of incense with both hands full. You ready? And look at me, and they would drop it into the altar of incense, and there was coals there, and they were burning. And what would happen is that incense would start catching on fire, and a cloud would fill the whole the whole area. It would just it would begin to fill the tabernacle. This cloud of the most beautiful smelling aroma, the incense burning. And the Bible says that our worship is like incense to Him, and our prayers that are lifted up are like incense. They are a beautiful aroma to the Lord. And when we worship God, and when we exalt him, 
Amen? It's like the beautiful incense burning, and it begins to feel and saturate everything, and it makes things pleasant. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you have spiritual eyes, you, I may be going too deep. I hope not. But you can see it. You can see incense. We're not burning any incense, and I'm not talking about our fog machine. Don't get the two confused. I'm talking about a spiritual thing. You can you just begin to sense it. You say, man, the whole atmosphere changed. What happened? Incense of worship. And you begin to worship the Lord. And when you do, this is the way we pray. It takes you into the next one. The ark or the holies of holies. And this represents the atonement for the world. What do you mean it represents atonement? Well, when you walked in and you looked at the ark, there were the cherubim or the angels on the lid of the ark and they were facing down and that's where they would sprinkle blood. The blood of the sacrifice that was the first thing that you did back on the brazen altar. They would take blood and they'd put it on the lid. Hang on just a minute, children. They would put it on the lid and the angels were looking down. They called that the mercy seat. And so what it was was the Spirit of God looking at the sacrifice instead of at the sin, at the mercy seat. And you go into the holies of holies. All right, kids, come on in. Hey, let's give the kids a hand as they're coming. Go sit with your parents. All the kids are coming in, these beautiful children. Now come sit with your parents. We're going to pray with you for a minute. So listen, as they're coming in, I want to tell you just a little bit more before we pray about number seven or number six, about about the ark and the atonement. So once you went through the process in prayer, you went to the cross, the brazen altar, you went to the laver, you looked at yourself, you asked the Holy Spirit to remove anything that was in the way of you and God, making God first. You went past that. You came to the menorah, the candlestick, and you just prayed, Lord, this, these seven things over me. And then, after that, you went to the showbread and you, you ate of the Word of God. And after that, you went into worship and the incense filled the whole house. And then you went past the veil into the holies of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant is, where atonement is being made for the sin of the world. Listen to me. You ready? This is, this is the biggest thing I'm going to tell you today. If you can get into the holies of holies, then you can do business. Your prayers, they, your punches land. When you pray, things happen. This is called breakthrough prayer. When you are in the holies of holies, the things that you will begin to pray and the things that will come out of your mouth are going to matter. You will become this prayer warrior. And I encourage you to practice it. This is where you get business done. You get business done in the holies of holies. A lot of times people pray what we call rocket prayers. Oh, Lord, help me not to be late to work. Right? Lord, give me a good day today at school, all the students and teachers. Today at work, Lord, I just pray that that person wouldn't drive me crazy. Whatever your prayer is, y'all know what rocket prayers are, right? Ugh, your rocket prayers are like this. Oh, God, help I'll just say this. If you can take the time to get into the holies of holies, those prayers land. God's pleased with you. And those prayers land. What does that mean? They, God answers them. But I also, want us, I also want to at the same time say this. We also have to practice getting to the holies of holies right away. I'm going to tell you something, guys. Listen, if you're in a car accident or something happens in your life that's real important, you don't just like, where's the showbread at? I need some showbread. In that moment, you need God right then. In that moment, I need you now. And God understands I need you now prayers. So what we have, you can go through the whole process in five minutes maybe. Or less. Even this, under the right circumstances, you can learn to step right in. Do you remember when I told you earlier that God is, instead of saying, God, come, God, come, and there's this resistance, God God is the one saying to his children, come. Come, come sit at my feet. 
Come drink out of my cup. Eat my bread. Live against me. Y'all understand? Remember when I told you that? And he's always asking, come. I want you to know. I want everyone to know this. This is, this, is, this is crazy breakthrough. You can go there in one step. If you live the life, if your heart's right, you can learn to go through those steps pretty quickly. By the, the Spirit of God will teach you to do that. I can't do that. You know, when I'm having a day and someone calls me and says, can you pray for me right now? I better get to the holies of holies quickly. Otherwise, the stuff coming out of my mouth is not going to land. Always ready in season or not. That's the way the Christian is supposed to live. And when people see that in you, they will want to know you will be the light of the world. They will want to know how do you do that. Can I be like you? And the church will grow. Souls will be saved. Amen. I hope you enjoyed that message today. Hey Amen. Can we just give the Holy Spirit a big hand? His plan is perfect. His plan is perfect.